This past Friday on Escape to the Movies, I reviewed Ender's Game, a not terribly good new movie that arrived in theaters under a cloud of controversy and threatened boycotts. Not because of anything that's actually in the tedious and perfunctory movie, but because sci-fi author Orson Scott Card, who wrote the classic 1985 novel that the film is based on, having spent the intervening years becoming a leading figure of the anti-gay equality movement, at this point less well known for his one unqualified success than he is for a series of increasingly unhinged, bigoted public statements and a one-time role as a leader in the notorious National Organization for Marriage. Like a lot of critics, I thought the elephant in the room had to be at least addressed, so I did so in a preface before moving on to the actual review. That said preface proved to draw significantly more feedback than the actual review isn't exactly a surprise, both because the internet is still the internet and because, frankly, creepy nutjob Orson Scott Card continuing to insert himself into the 21st century civil rights battle is much more interesting than watching a barely ambulatory Harrison Ford teach Cole Seer Mark II how to play EVE Online for Kinect. But it's also part of a much, much larger ongoing discussion in the fields of professional criticism, and I mean all of it. Art, literature, films, television, and yes, that fresh-faced new kid, gaming. The eternal question of whether criticism is best left devoid of acknowledging external or tangential influencing factors upon a work, or is a critique somehow incomplete or even dishonest without those acknowledgments. Except the question isn't actually eternal, it's really only a few centuries old, if that. Originally, criticism was considered an art or literary form in and of itself. In fact, you might call it the larval stage of the remix. Criticisms in the classical era were meant to be demonstrations of the critic's insight, humor, or cleverness, or pro using the work under scrutiny as a jumping-off point. Frequently, such criticism came in the form of artistic or philosophical schools. A Socratic critique of an Enlightenment novel, a modernist critique of a Baroque painting, that sort of thing. Think of it as mixed martial arts for intellectual disciplines. Then think of how droll it would be to start describing MMA matches in terms of a Muay Thai critique of capoeira. What it was never intended to do was tell you if you should see something. Why would it? These were the days when the fruits of the art world and the cultured class were exclusively by and for the art world and the cultured class. The idea of consumer criticism would have been alien to them. Of course we're going to see it. We have literally nothing else to do with our time. All that changed with the arrival of the Industrial Revolution and the emergence of a sustainable middle class, i.e. people who had some money to spend on art as leisure entertainment, but not all of the money. This gave rise to a new breed of journalistic criticism centered on the popular arts, i.e. theater, music, and eventually film. Criticism that was less about philosophy or theory and closer to, well, reportage, consumer reporting for the arts, basically. It was still all opinion, granted, but it was opinion pitched as broadly as possible, often boiled down to a simplistic, is this worth your money, and attempting to imagine a hypothetical average audience and gauge for them what their opinion was likely to be. And for a time, that was mainstream criticism, mainstream film criticism in particular, where it became so entrenched and overriding that the idea of a return to theory, the idea of going beyond nuts and bolts consumer reporting, to movies in the early 60s, starting with the Cahiers de Cinema Cats, was considered revolutionary. Revolutionary enough to engender a backlash, in fact, that continues to this day, holding that the only true film criticism is conducted by those affecting a monk-like abstention from any influence other than the 90 or so minutes spent watching the movie, and that bringing anything else into the discussion like related real-life issues, politics, influence on the audience, noteworthy behaviors or opinions of the filmmakers, or even simply viewing the work through the lens of a school like feminist theory or critical race theory, was at best wrong-headed and at worst a corruption of supposedly pure critique, a violation of modern opinion journalism's most cherished self-flattering myth, objectivity. See, the just the facts, ma'am, mainstream criticism was and remains to a certain extent a necessary service, to be sure, but it also gave rise to one of the great pernicious false paradigms of modern culture, that it's possible to discern a model of the singular average ordinary person who represented a baseline societal starting point of normal. Obviously that doesn't work, but it gets more ridiculous when you consider that the people deciding what normal was weren't exactly behavioral statisticians. They were, well, the critical and journalistic establishment. Do I have to draw you a picture? Yeah, mostly older, hetero white dudes who, like most people who spend most of their time in the company of people just like them who share their perspectives and most of their opinions, viewed the hypothetical normal in terms of themselves. Now, that's not necessarily wrong, it's just boring as all hell, but it skewed the way they conceived their aforementioned ideal of pure criticism in my estimation. It's easy to say, and even sincerely feel, that someone is unnecessarily dragging their own agenda or baggage into their criticism if they raise issues of race, class, gender, sexual politics, etc., if those are things you don't always think about that aren't part of your everyday life experience, or in the parlance of the more recent backlash against broader-themed gaming criticism, why are we talking about all this other stuff? Just give me the frame rates and tell me how it plays! Especially if you belong to a one-time majority and still entrenched privileged class who had culture and media subtly reinforcing you and your perspective as humanity's natural center for most of your life. Hell, that was me not that long ago, as a freshly minted college graduate with a nice shiny film degree who of course knew it all and had everything figured out, I completely bought into the idea that pure objective film criticism was the ideal and wondered why all these angry feminists or oversensitive minorities couldn't just set their little issues aside and just watch the damn movie. I mean, I could do that, right? 
Fortunately, I grew up, and growing up meant recognizing normal doesn't exist, that averages are a mathematical construct with little use or meaning in the flesh and blood reality, and that objectivity is a goal to strive for in the Zen sense that you recognize no one can ever actually achieve it in full. It meant acknowledging that I have my own quirks and preferences and biases and triggers that are no more valid than those of others, even though it's often hard for me to see them myself. I mean, how often do you think about the stuff you don't think about? How often does one, to borrow a well-meaning but in desperate need of retirement phrase, check your privilege? The conclusion I've arrived at, for me at least, is that pure versus impure criticism in film or gaming or anything else is a false dichotomy, because purity and pure objectivity simply don't exist. Even if I do purge my mind of outside considerations, artistic appraisal is all opinion and perspective, and those are inexorably subject to mood, health, all sorts of factors. Should the pure critic also drink only flat water and nourish only by protein gruel to prevent a good beer or a crappy sandwich at some point in the day from affecting their disposition? Because, brother, I'm not going to do that. And I'm also not going to tell others that bringing their quote-unquote baggage about politics or social justice or whatever into criticism makes their work somehow less valid than mine. Because it doesn't. Besides, I think the opposite is often true. Stuffy and, yes, pretentious as it might have been, the old classical model of critical theories in schools can, in its resurgent modern form, be quite valuable. Using criticism as a medium for expressing ideas can be incredibly potent in that it lets you explain often complex concepts using the work being criticized as a familiar reference point, like, say, how a certain infamous series of video essays has used criticism of overused storytelling cliches in gaming as a way of explaining foundational elements of feminist theory to audiences that might not be familiar with them. And to be frank, I think criticism, particularly film criticism, and definitely game criticism, could use a lot more of that. Not only does it keep things interesting, it makes a culture broader-minded, bigger thinking, more diverse, and just plain smarter. There are so many genres and subgenres, so many types of stories to tell, so many techniques to use, so many types of movies, so many styles of game. Why should there not also be as near infinite a manner of ways to critique them? And why should any of those ways be judged inferior to any other in concept rather than execution? Because at the end of the day, all I can swear to do in my reviews of movies, games, or anything else is tell you my honest thoughts, regardless of what inspired or triggered them or how relevant someone else may consider them. And frankly, I will take an honest criticism over someone's idea of supposedly pure critique every single time. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Thank you.